Hello, this is Albert van Dijk and in this little uh, video I want to talk a bit uh, about atmospheric remote sensing and then particularly weather remote sensing as opposed to, for instance, climate or air pollution remote sensing. Um, so um, here's a, a, a sort of a diagram that shows you some of the uh, uh, properties in the or constituents of the atmosphere that interact with, uh, with sunlight and with radiation emitted uh, from the land. So we've got the irradiance coming in from the sun uh, the surface irradiance, that which is um, uh, re uh, reflected, and then we got the emissions from the uh, the long wave emissions from the surface, uh, according to Planck's law in the uh, typical the infrared domain and beyond. And um, in here you see things like gases, aerosols, cloud properties, rain, and all these things interact, of course, with both the uh, the sun's radiation and the emitted radiation from the land, and we can use it to good effect to work out. The, uh, the state of the uh, atmosphere and, and, and uh, use that information in predicting weather. So, um, in the very first video, we talked about the first environmental observation satellite, and that was the Tyrus in, uh, in the 1960s. Uh, and here's uh, that, f that first image that came through. And of course, uh, you know, when people saw this, when weather forecasters saw this, they thought, this is fantastic. We, you know, imagine before that they, they had no idea uh, of, weather system of a weather system coming. Or maybe you know somebody might have called, I suppose, but they had no good picture of what the atmosphere looked like uh, over the larger region. And you know, as soon as these sorts of images came through, uh, they started realizing exactly how the weather patterns uh, were and what was coming that way. And that was, of course, the revolution in weather forecasting. Now we'll fast forward to the current day, and uh, we've seen this picture before. And there's this whole smorgasbord of uh, satellite as well as ground data being assimilated in weather forecasting systems. Uh, and we talked about this in a previous video, but um, you know it goes all the way from geostationary satellites with these typical disk-like uh, uh, collection areas uh, to to uh, infrared microwave sounders, uh, radar, uh, and so forth. So there's a a, a whole uh, a series of satellites that is being used. Um, a few pictures again from previous videos where we can look at the temperature of the sea surface and tell us you know whether warm or, or cold currents. Are uh, are are um, you know move, making their way? We can look. Uh, we can use radar to look at wind speed and direction. We can work out you know, uh, from the wave height where the wind is coming from and uh, and and how hard it's blowing. Uh, we can uh, look at the microwave uh, uh, data to to look at the uh, water vapor contents of the atmosphere, uh, and we can look at thermal remote sensing to look for cold cloud tops, for instance, of high clouds uh, that are likely to have a lot of water in them. Uh, as well as, uh, of course, looking at the, uh, the, the temperature of the land surface and so forth. Now, um, one thing we haven't really talked about before, or maybe it's been briefly mentioned, is atmospheric sounding. And that's actually a pretty complicated uh, uh, retrieval uh, technique. But essentially, I guess I'm just going to try and give you a brief sense of, of how it works, uh, is, uh, is that it, it looks at uh, the... Uh, uh, it, it, it infers the vertical profile in the atmospheric column of uh, temperature and humidity, for example, uh, by looking at the uh, emission in uh, very narrow wavelengths uh, from from different heights in that column. And uh, and how can it do that? Well, that's because uh, uh, different part, you know, components of the of the of the air, such as CO two and ozone, for instance, have very specific effects. Uh, on, on emission and absorption of radiation, and so uh, uh, they absorb the uh, the the, the uh, emission of uh, of radiation in the infrared and microwave domain, uh, not only from the surface but also from the different levels in the atmosphere. Uh, and by doing an inverse modeling, you can you can again infer from the end result what that profile needs to look like in order to match the um, the the observed. Uh, patterns such as the red curve might be. Uh, and we can do that because some gases are more prevalent in the upper atmosphere, such as ozone, and others more in the lower atmosphere, such as CO2. Um, that's probably all you need to know, really, to understand the basic principle of atmospheric sounding. It's just an example of, uh, uh, of what you get when you do that. You see here in white colors, very moist air, and in, uh, in black or dark colors, you see uh, quite dry air. You see you know, quite detailed in three dimensions how that system is uh, is moving across the United States in this case, what the uh, the uh, atmospheric layers and currents look like. So really useful information. 
Uh, one thing we didn't talk about previously uh, uh, that's also quite useful and you might end up using in your research or, or, or in other ways is this thing called reanalysis. So we talked about data simulation and forecasting. We talked about how the model uh, is corrected when we make an observation and we try to sort of assess what the, what the real state is and we assume that the red is our best estimate of the, uh, of the real state. So um, where this says truth, I should say that's truth according to the observations, but we actually don't believe that that is the absolute truth because we assume the observation has some error too. So this is our best estimate based on what we know about the errors in the model and the observations. And we move that a time step, and then we do the same and so forth. Now, if I collect these values, these red boxes, if you like, and string those together into a time series, uh, then I've got my best estimate at every time step of the state of the atmosphere, whether that be temperature or rainfall or whatever. And that's what we call a reanalysis. We can also call it now cast, but the term reanalysis kind of stuff. So it's a way of integrating lots of different observations within one framework. And those time series, the data sets are really useful to look at things like um, weather and climate change over longer periods. All right, now one more uh, uh, example of using satellite remote sensing is uh, in lightning detection. Now you might not know this, but actually uh, we have uh, uh, most countries, certainly most developed countries, have lightning detection systems that tell them, give them a head warning of severe thunderstorms and, and lightning. Um, and uh, allow weather forecasting uh, or agencies such as the Bureau of Meteorology to, to give out warnings. And um, we can do that using satellites as well. And one way that we do that, or the main way that we do that, is by, by looking at the emission of, um, of, uh, of radiation in very narrow wavelengths. So when electricity goes through the air, it excites, excites the atoms, um, the, uh, the uh, oxygen atoms, for instance, in the, in the atmosphere. Uh, and when those uh, uh, oxygen atoms uh, fall back to their normal state, they emit uh, that, that energy uh, uh, in the form of radiation. And that happens in very specific narrow bands. In my course from physics, there's this with emission bands. Uh, and so uh, this is not temperature related, but this is uh, 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 related to the state of the, of the electrons in the atom. Uh, and so in this case, there's a very narrow uh, region 777.4 nanometers, which is one of the oxygen emission lines. Uh, and so when an oxygen atom is excited by lightning and falls back to its normal state, it emits in this uh, infrared uh, uh, wavelength. And we can measure that very uh, accurately using satellites. And then you can you know, basically see where lightning is, is, uh, is going. So in this case, for instance, you see an example of, uh, of lightning you see the, the, uh, the most recent lightning occurrences in white and uh, those of an hour ago in blue and you can see how this system is moving uh, and the lightning along uh, with it uh, uh, towards the uh, east coast on this particular day. So there's another example of satellite um, remote sensing being used for weather forecasting. Uh, here's what that looks like globally and of course we can do climatologies and whatnot and as you can see, that the uh, the, in, you know, the champion globally of uh, lightning seems to be Congo. There's an awful lot of lightning there, uh, and as, as you might expect, the tropics where there's more rain, there's typically more lightning. Um, similarly, uh, we've got sort of severe weather warning systems in place uh, using satellites uh, for uh, rainfall and uh, associated flash flooding and landslides and so forth as well. So here's an example from the tropical rainfall measuring mission or the TRIM satellite uh, which has been uh, 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 going over the earth for quite a long time and is now replaced by another mission called the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission. Um, and that is able to, to really measure, similar to a rainfall radar uh, uh, on the ground, uh, it measures the, the occurrence of, uh, of rainfall and here's just a, a visualization of that of a big uh, convective storm system um, off the coast of Madagascar and here a system moving across the US and it really helps you where you don't have rainfall radar on the ground this is a fantastic way of seeing oh, look there's something on the way there's something developing here um, uh, we better um, keep ourselves safe and that's then used in, in uh, websites like this from NASA uh, called the uh, 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 in, well named in this case heavy rain flood and landslide estimates uh, system. So an experimental system, but actually used uh, a fair bit to look at where heavy rain is occurring and where it might go next 
uh, and therefore to uh, to uh, uh, allow emergency services to ad adjust to that. Okay, well that was uh, this uh, short video on the use of satellite remote sensing and weather forecasting, and then in the next video I want to talk a little bit more about its use in climate change research uh, and uh, and uh, pollution detection, for instance.